Edward Arnold in The Man Who Wouldn't Be President on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Cavalcade brings you the story of Daniel Webster, the greatest speaker America has produced, one of the six greatest orators of all time, mighty champion of the Constitution in those years when the nation was threatening to split asunder. Edward Arnold appears tonight through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, in whose production, The War Against Mrs. Hadley, he is now starring. Presenting Edward Arnold as Daniel Webster in The Man Who Wouldn't Be President on the Cavalcade of America. Webster, they called him, and in the year 1839, widespread was his fame. Black Dan Webster? Well, I say, there's the greatest man in the USA. He's the one we want for president. But Black Dan's so powerful that once he talks the very devil out of taking away a man's soul. Six years at sea I've been, and I tell you, they've heard of Dan Webster from Port Fed to Singapore. Why, they say he wears a blonde stone for a watch fob, and is so rich he's owned the mint the gold to get started with. Caroline. I've been looking for you, dear. I thought it would be nice for us to watch the New York Harbor appear. We dock in a little while. Yes, I know. Oh, Dan, it's wonderful to be coming home again. And with the next president of the United States. <laughs> well, you are very hopeful, my dear. And why not? Didn't the Whigs promise before we sailed last summer that you would be our next president? Well, now that you mention oh, it. Oh, Dan, it's thrilling to think that my husband is going to be the next president. Uh, Caroline, we've worked uh, very hard uh, to further presidential ambitions. And four years from now, we're going to have our award. I always said four, four years from now. Uh, well, Caroline, I don't know how to tell you this. The pilot just brought the papers aboard. I'm not going to get the president, presidential nomination from the Whig Party this time. Oh, Dan. I know, I know. It's a blow. All your career, Dan, all of it has led only toward the day when you would be president. What can the party be thinking of? What reward is this? Now, Caroline, my dear, Henry Clay has good reason. The party has laid its plans very carefully. Henry Clay, but he told me... Political expediency alters all things, my dear. We've got to have dramatic slogans, popular catchphrases, and a famous soldier to oppose the military reputation of Andrew Jackson's party. You mean old Tippecanoe, General Harrison? Mm, Harrison, plus a man who can carry this out. You couldn't mean John Tyler. Yes, but he's not important. Who remembers vice presidents? But Tyler is no Whig. And for General Harrison, just because he won a battle is no reason... Political expediency again, my dear. The slogan doesn't look bad in print, does it? Tipper Canoe and Tyler, too. <laughs> like something those old men at Sandal Hall would contrive. Tipper Canoe and Tyler, too. Why, that'll sweep the country like wildfire. It's tremendous. Is it? Oh, Dan, don't try to hide your feelings. Being president has been your dream and mine. Since you were a boy, you've worked for it, lived for it. There's not another man in the United States with your fitness for that office. <laughs> you say nothing I haven't told myself, but... I, well, there's no use trying to deceive you, Caroline. I am sick about it. On the, on the other hand, we, we've had some rather homely truths forced on us, which we can't overlook. Homely truths? Yes, you see, I'm looked upon as a moneyed man. A what? Yes, really. One of the rich, a plutocrat, they call me in the West. <laughs> Little do they know. You could have been rich, you know. Your law practice was very lucrative. Well, I can go back to it now. Is that what you would like to do? More to the point. Is that what you would like to have me do? Oh, Dan, darling, no. No, you've got to stay in politics. You've got to show this country what a great man you really are. Yes, I think you're right. It's all clear to me now, and the groundwork is laid, well laid. We'll engineer the Whig party into power with Harrison and Tyler. 
The next convention, four years hence, will be a different story. Over here, Nally. Nally, over here. Bring the carriage over. Yes, sir, Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. How are you, Nally? Oh, fine, sir. Howdy, Miss Webster. How are you, Nally? Very fine. Welcome home. Welcome home. Look, Dan, a torchlight parade. Well, it started. You hear that, Caroline? Tippecanoe and Hyla, too. General Harrison, hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe. Already men march to it. A catchy phrase, a slogan, and the Whig Party will be in power. Dan Webster's party. You will be president. The people want you, Dan. Even in England, they think of you as the most important leader in America. Yes, Dan, you'll be president, and what a wonderful president you'll make. <laughs> you know, my dear, I kind of think you're right. <laughs> Read all about it. Wig convention nominates General Harrison, Tippy Canoe, and John Tyler, too. Get your paper. Election Extra. Harrison and Tyler leading. Extra. Final Extra. General Harrison becomes president. Read all about the plans for the inauguration. Read all about it. I, William Henry Harrison, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, just call me General. You know, I can't get used to Mr. President yet. I've <laughs> been trying to get a minute with you for days, sir. You have a cigar. Well, thank you, General. You know, it's mighty nice of you to fix up my inaugural address for me, Dan. Never was so good at making speeches. Well, I'm glad to do anything I can for our party. Oh, Dan, I... I suppose Clay has already told you what I have on my mind. You mean about my becoming Secretary of State? Yes, Dan. I want you. I need you in my cabinet. General, I sincerely appreciate this honor, but I'm afraid I must return to my private law practice, at least for a while. Dan, I'm a soldier. I'll come to my objective. Looks like there's another war on the border. The Aroostook affair is, well, it's serious. The Canadians have already fired the first shot. Oh, well, I needn't tell you about it. Congress has voted $10 million and 50,000 men. You talk of the war was inevitable. It is, Dan. We've always had war of some kind with England, always will. But right now, we're at peace only because of a truce which might be broken at any minute. Ah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. War with England can be avoided now and forever. Do you hear? Now and forever, if we will only work out a fair and lasting basis for peace. Impossible. Nothing's impossible. We have fought two wars and Lord knows how many skirmishes during the past 50 years. And over what? Over piddling questions that can be settled permanently over a conference. Mm -hmm. What are your ideas on the subject? Well, while I was in England, I met a friend who once had lived in New York and knows our point of view, Lord Ashburton. We talked then of something so simple yet so tremendous that we ourselves were awed by it. A treaty between ourselves and Great Britain which would write and end to wars. Sounds like a pipe dream, Dan. What a great thing if you can do it. Would I have your fullest backing then? Have it your way, Dan. You'll be running the State Department. Then I will think it over, General Harrison. Well, let me know soon. And remember, this all points to the next Whig convention four years away. You're working toward the presidency, Dan. I'll be at the convention, and they'll nominate anybody else than Dan Webster over my dead body. Why, every influence I've got, I... <gasps> my General. Oh! Mr. President, what's wrong? <laughs> Nothing. I... I'll be all right. Catches me sometimes right here. Well, can I get you a glass no, of water? No, no, no. Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> I, I got to get some rest, I guess. Of course. <sighs> Remember, Dan, my promise comes from the heart. 
to Edward Arnold as Daniel Webster in The Man Who Wouldn't Be President on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. As our play continues, Lord Ashburton has arrived to discuss the treaty with Daniel Webster. I do have some more of the port, Lord Ashburton. Don't mind if I do. Hmm. Excellent port, Mr. Webster. Thank you. Now about the treaty. Well, I see you're as eager as I am to get on with our business. I believe we understand each other perfectly. I believe we do. Keep it a simple treaty, I say. Let us distill a document of not more than five pages of writing. Something at which any man may glance and almost immediately say, yes, this is for the peace of the world. This is for the understanding of nations. This is good. Precisely. And let us work with our wording until it stands crystal clear and unmistakable. We must at all times remember we are working for the peace and goodwill of our nations who are really brothers. If our efforts are successful, then perhaps our ideals of peace may spread throughout the world. I think your plan is beautiful, even sublime, my dear Webster. But after we've drawn such a treaty, can we get it passed? There's my parliament to be considered and your senate. Well, it'll be a struggle. But there is a good chance for us, my lord. I am as free to act as any secretary of state has been in our history. Your queen has given you extraordinary powers of negotiation. Yes. Yes, Caroline, what's wrong? Oh, Dan, I saw flares by the White House. Heard shouting. I sent Nally to see. Nally? Yes. Nally, come in here. Yes. Tell Mr. Webster what you heard. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I did just like Mrs. Webster say. Went to see all about the excitement. Yes, yes. Well, what happened? He's dead, Mr. Webster. General Harrison. Dead? The president? Yes, sir. Good heavens. Why, He's only just been put in office. Hardly a month. Get the carriage ready at once, Nellie. Yes. Webster, what might this mean to my mission? I can't tell you at this moment. The vice president, John Tyler, automatically, automatically becomes president. He disagrees with our party generally and with me in particular. Heaven only knows if he will even retain me in the cabinet. I must go see our party leader at once, Henry Clay. Hurry, Nellie, don't stand there gaping. The carriage. <laughs> what to tell you, Dan, until Tyler gets here and we know if his real allegiance turns out to be toward his old party or ours. You don't understand, Henry. I'm wondering about the treaty between us and England. You don't understand me, Dan. I'm wondering if you may not have to resign from the cabinet. Why should I have to resign? Unless Tyler wants to make a new appointment. Oh, Tyler will retain you in the cabinet. Don't worry about that. Composed of the best men in the country. Question is not whether Tyler will retain the cabinet. Whether the cabinet might not have to abandon Tyler. You shock me, Henry. If Tyler will only retain me, I... Why, how can I abandon this work? Perhaps the most important treaty this country ever negotiated. One that will forever settle our differences with Great Britain. Dan, don't you understand that if you remain in Tyler's cabinet, it may cost you the presidency? Already we know he's not loyal to the Whigs. He'll give us lip service and secretly carry out policies of Andrew Jackson. Ah, oh. You mark my words, Dan. You must get out of the Tyler cabinet. Otherwise, your political future is dead. The treaty with England can wait. The treaty with England can wait. Wait while Dan Webster plays politics. Wait until Dan Webster pays his tail. Wait, wait. I say no. Not when we've seen men of the same mother country, the same language, the same heritage of honor killing each other in wars over what? Politics and taxes and all the mean little disputes between selfish men. No, Henry. I'm going on with it. England and these United States bound to each other by an everlasting treaty of peace and goodwill as a name far above my insignificant ambitions. I stay with Tyler. Well then, sir, you and I have nothing further to discuss. <laughs> That's all, Nally. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shall I poke up the fire some more? No, Nally. No, that's all. Run along. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it true, sir, that they put President Tyler out in the Whig party today, sir? 
Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. They read President Tyler out of the party today. Now run along, Nellie. I want to think and along. Yes, sir. I won't let nobody in the library know her. And now we have a president without a party. <laughs> the cabinet is resigned, all but me. They ask my decision. My decision. <laughs> All day they dinned at me, my friends and my colleagues. Dan, you're making a mistake. You're through if you stick with Tyler. Dan, I loaned you $10,000. Do as your party wants, Dan. Dan, I've always wanted my husband to become president. Advice, demands, pleadings, dinning at me all day. The country won't understand why you're staying in Tyler's cabinet, Dan. They'll call you a traitor to your party, Mr. Webster. You've got to get out. Resign with the rest of the cabinet or you'll never be president. Stop it! Stop it! Voices, voices, I've heard them all day telling me what to do, telling me what Excuse to do. Me, Mr. Webster. Excuse yes, me, Nellie, yes. I thought I told yes, you that... Yes, sir, I know, sir. Excuse me, sir, but he's in great dudgeon to Lord Ashburton, sir. Ashburton will show him in. Come in, sir, yes, come in, sir. come in. Forgive me for disturbing you, but I've just heard the amazing news that your entire cabinet has resigned. Naturally, I must communicate the status of things at once to the Prime Minister. Uh, tell me, Lord Ashburton, if I must resign, don't you feel you can carry on with my successor? I was expecting that question, my dear friend. I can only say that the matter of a peace agreement could not be carried on. But surely there Let must... me be frank. My government considers yours very difficult to deal with. You are one of the few Americans in public life in whom my government has confidence. I don't believe I can offer the slightest hope of getting the treaty passed unless I can assure them that I deal with Daniel Webster. I see. <laughs> Thank you for being so frank, my lord. Thank you very much. For the good of our two great countries... I hope your decision will be to let me inform the Prime Minister that you will remain in office. Lord Ashburton, you may tell the Prime Minister that I have placed the treaty we have designed above the strife that now tears my party apart. I shall remain as Secretary of State. I believe I can understand the sacrifice you'll be making. And I give you the humble thanks of generations to come. But... What effect will your remaining in the cabinet have on the passage of the treaty through the Senate? Uh, Henry Clay and the rest of the party will never forgive me. They will lead the entire party against us to the bitter end. And I can only say, I shall do my best. Mr. President, I demand the floor. I demand the Senate proceed as usual. Secretary of State has been given the floor. Secretary of State. That Dan's going to talk the treaty. What good it'll do him, I don't know. Henry Clay will fix him. Clay never forgave him for sticking to Tyler. He's reached the speaker's stand. Uh, Mr. President, and gentlemen of the august chamber where I so long sat as a member, I come before you on behalf of a treaty with Great Britain for which my office now seeks your ratification according to the Constitution. Over what do Great Britain and ourselves disagree at this late date? The Canadian boundary, whose precise location has never been settled. The slave trade, which we all agree we can stop if our navies only cooperate. The British Navy's refusal to stop searching our ships at sea for sailors of British blood, which can be stopped by agreement. Now, gentlemen, these are simple questions. Ratify this treaty, I say, and you will give to the great nations of Canada and the United States the only boundary in the world not bristling with guns and not guarded by soldiers. Consider now Article 9, wherein Great Britain agrees jointly with us to suppress the trade in slaves. I say to you that if we do not pass this treaty, the despairing cries of men who to this day are being sold into bondage may haunt your dreams forever. Along the African coast where the port still rings with hammer blows making manacles for human limbs, the hellish train goes down. And so, gentlemen, I leave to your consideration this document which will, for all generations to come, make an ally of the nation which has been for the past 50 years at odds with us. I leave in your hands the fate of nations. Their fate today and for generations to come. I thank you. Senator from Canada.
Kentucky, Mr. Henry Clay. Mr. President, my remarks on the question of passing the treaty will be brief. I am for its passage without the change of a comma or a period. <laughs> of the Senate, the vote on the treaty with England, in favor, 39, opposed, 9. Henry, let me thank you for what you did today. Congratulations, Dan. You know, when you first rose to speak, I was against you, as was every senator of our party. But when I heard you, when I sensed the urgency and sincerity behind what you said, I knew then that you'd indeed sacrificed your chances of ever becoming the president of the United States for something far greater. Do you still think I was crazy to do it? Dan, I think you're a great American. What more can I say than that? Thank you, Henry. Good night. Good night, Dan. Dan, you're wonderful. And may I say, my dear, that you are extraordinarily beautiful? Oh, Dan, I do love you. Ah, then I've had two triumphs today. And you know now that you can never step out of public life. Only Dan Webster has the power, when every other man has failed, to make men believe in what's right. You can never retire. Yes, it looks as if it's the Senate for the rest of my life. And a lifetime of bills unpaid. But, oh, Dan, what a wonderful president you would have made. You know, my dear, I rather think so myself. <laughs> yes, I rather think so myself. <laughs> Edward Arnold. Ladies and gentlemen, later in the broadcast, Mr. Arnold will return to the microphone. Before he does, Gain Whitman has exciting news of a new group of chemical compounds. Newspapers recently carried a news item from an aircraft corporation stating that flexible plastic tubing is being used in many of the new warplanes. The item was given only a few lines of type, no headlines. But the fact behind the news is that this flexible tubing, made of a new group of vinyl resins, represents an important contribution to the war effort made by American industry. Moreover, this group of vinyl resins, as they are known to chemists, in itself represents a new contribution of chemistry that may do a great deal to make this world a better place in which to live when at last the war is won. For this flexible plastic tubing, which today is carrying gasoline to the roaring motors of America's fighter planes, without risk of breakage from vibration, or the action of gasoline and hot oil, is only one of the things already being made of these new materials. The polyvinyl alcohols and polyvinyl acetates, as chemists call some of these resins, are white powders that look in their initial form rather like cornstarch. Modified and compounded, they become threads or films or sheets, clear or opaque or colored. When they're molded or cast, they're like rubber. They're flexible, tough, resistant to abrasion, and light in weight. And the many things they can do are as remarkable as the properties of the materials themselves. For instance, vinyl resins in the form of adhesives are taking the place today of tons of latex, natural rubber. Vinyl resin adhesives are so firm in their grip that wood-bonded metal actually splits and tears apart before the adhesive itself will give. Electric wires can be given a coating of vinyl resin for insulation so thin that you can hardly see it on the wires. Gloves and aprons can be made that withstand virtually all of the solvents and oils used in industry. Their wartime uses only begin to indicate the possibilities open to such vinyl compounds after the war. There are machines in war plants today using vinyl resin valves, where metal valves can't stand the gap. There are vinyl compounds that can be used to line oil and greaseproof containers that replace containers of metal. For example, ration kits for the army. 
Polyvinyl alcohol has improved the weaving properties of some of the new textile materials. Other vinyl resins improve paper in tough paper containers that replace metal containers. There are vinyl resins that can be tinted in beautiful colors. There are resin bonded papers that are of value because they have some of the properties and do some of the jobs not done by cork. There are laminated fabrics that are flexible and more resistant to shock and abrasion than many metals. In fact, one of the most valuable properties of polyvinyl alcohol is that even in thin films, it is unbelievably tough and strong. There are vinyl and other plastics available even today, which can be so treated that their tensile strength is equal to that of steel. They will stand a pull of 60,000 pounds to the square inch. They're being tested now in scores of ways to find out just those special fields for which their properties best suit them. This is only a brief glimpse of an exciting new contribution of the chemist. But brief as it is, it gives you, beyond the wartime uses of these new vinyl resins, a forecast of what is to come of a whole new group of future DuPont better things for better living through chemistry. And now the star of tonight's cavalcade, Edward Arnold. Thank you, thank you. Or should I have introduced you as Dan Webster? Well, Dan Webster is one of my favorite heroes, John. It's fitting for Cavalcade to celebrate this year the 100th anniversary of a treaty that joined our country and England in a pact of friendship. That was a great service to his country. Well said, Mr. Arnold. And now, John, and friends everywhere, here is a service you can render. Put 10% of your salary into war bonds. Join up tomorrow, won't you? If you can't make it 10%, make it all you can, because that way Uncle Sam can count on its coming in every month. The money you invest does double duty. It buys safety for your country, and it buys your personal security in the years ahead when you will be getting back $4 for every three you've invested in freedom. Now pass the word along, will you? A dime from every dollar, every payday. Thank you, Edward Arnold. Next week, Cavalcade celebrates the Christmas season with a modern miracle play, A Child is Born, especially written by Stephen Vincent Benet, distinguished American poet. In this moving interpretation of the old story of the nativity, to which Mr. Benet gives fresh significance for our war-torn world, Lynn Fontaine and Alfred Lunt will be Cavalcade's stars. Our story tonight was written by Hector Chevigny. Included in the cast were Agnes Moorhead as Caroline, William Farnham as President Harrison, Joseph Kearns as Henry Clay. Next week, Lynn Fontan and Alfred Lunt, co-starring in Stephen Vincent Benet's poetic nativity play, A Child is Born. Cavalcade is honored to announce that this will be the first co-starring appearance of Mr. Lunt and Miss Fontan on any sponsored broadcast. The musical score in tonight's program was composed and directed by Robert Armbruster. This is John Heaston sending best wishes from DuPont. came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.